salvation, okay, is Christ. So, let's just talk about that first. So, the passage here is Matthew chapter 16. So, uh, and this is somewhat of a pivotal passage, I think, uh, for Baptists at least. And uh, I think it does give the... So, in Matthew chapter 16 then, Jesus takes... He takes his disciples away. And so if you if you follow the progression of Matthew, Matthew chapter 16 is kind of it's almost it's sort of the center of the book. They call it the watershed. So from 16 on, then pretty much everything flows toward the cross. It's been building up to Jesus calling his disciples, sending out his disciples instructing his disciples, teaching his disciples. So they've been doing that for a while. But in Matthew chapter 16, and this is the one of the uh, key places in Matthew where uh, there, the, the, it's called Christological, where, where the Christology of Christ gets crystallized. So it says in verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is. And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So the question then, at the heart of, of Christianity, is who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? So you, you got to answer that one. Um, and that really is, it distinguishes what it means to be a disciple. Who is Jesus? So Jesus asked the question, who's, who do people say that I am? And even today, if you were to ask that question, most people are very complimentary of Jesus. Muslims, they believe he was a prophet. Jews believe he was a good teacher. Um, you know, other world religions, even people that would claim to be atheists would say that Jesus taught good things. And so the disciples then, they asked, they Every answer is complimentary. Some say you're John the Baptist, who had been killed. Uh, some say you're Elijah, and some say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Every answer was complimentary. But that's not enough. Then he says, but you, he said, who do you say that? And it wasn't y'all, it was who do you? And that that's really gets down to this whole issue of salvation and the church and 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 what Jesus is driving toward then is that the, the foundation of the church is Jesus. So Simon Peter then, who is supposedly representing the group, we know that Judas Iscariot's in the group and he becomes a traitor and uh, you know betrays Jesus. Uh, and all of them except John the Beloved, scatter uh, at the, when Jesus is crucified. The only one at the foot of the cross was John, uh, the, the beloved disciple. But, but, but then Peter says, but he, the spokesman for the group, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. So that, that's the confession then of the early church. So the foundation of the church is not just, isn't just, Jesus, then, it's the, it's the confession on which the fact that Jesus, the uh, confession uh, that He is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ. So there's this, this whole aspect of we are, we are a confessional uh, covenant community. So our, our common, the commonality of the church then is that we confess Jesus as the Christ. Uh, it isn't enough to believe. You have to confess and commit. So the confession then. So here's, here's what he says. Then. Jesus responded, Simon, son of Jonah, 
You are blessed because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So then, confession then uh, comes from, uh, from the Holy Spirit. Even our ability to confess that He is Lord is is given to us. You didn't figure this out on your own. It, it, this isn't an intellectual ascent. This isn't an academic ascent. Although the, all those are involved. This is a this is a confirmation of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is the Christ. And at some point you and I have to come to that belief that he is who he says he is. And, and, and so that, that then becomes the foundation of the church. So he, he says, flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but my Father in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter. And so it's a, it's, it's a play on words. Peter is the Greek word Petros. And it means little Rock. So it's, 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 it's a play that Jesus is using a play on words. Uh, you are Peter, the, the Petros, the little rock. And upon this rock. And it's not... So here, here's part of where we part ways with the Roman Catholic Church. Upon this rock. They believe and have for centuries that... Peter, that the church is built on Peter. And they see Peter as the first pope. Now that, that's where they get this. It's from the, that, he, that you're Peter, and upon this rock, that he meant Peter himself, that we're going to build our church. So therefore, they built it, the church upon uh, Peter, Peter and his confession, but they go to a person, and so they chase their they trace their lineage back to Peter. Uh, what we believe, and most evangelicals would believe, that the rock then is the confession, is the confession of Peter, and uh, the, the confession of Peter that that Jesus is the Christ. Okay. And upon this, the rock, the confession. So it would tie, it would tie into this. Uh, it would tie into this, that He is the Christ. So we, we don't believe that, that the church is built on any human being. It's built on Jesus Himself. And then He goes on to say, I'll build my church, and the forces of Haiti will not overcome it. So then the foundation of the church then is Jesus. And so then everything we do, if that is true, if that, if that is in fact true, then, uh, then the church is built on, on the person of Christ, but also the teachings of Christ. Okay? And... Uh, the work of Christ on the cross and the uh, resurrection. And you could have gone to say the, the founding of the early church, uh, the early church, how it was founded, and all that. So, does that make sense? That's, that's, the, that's what we believe about the church, that foundation is Jesus, it's built on the fact of the, that He is the Christ. And if you go to John's Gospel, then it, he, John's Gospel reaches all the way back to Genesis 1, where in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Where Genesis 1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So Jesus then is, is, is part of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, we talked about that the first week. The Holy Spirit uh, 
is the is the the presence that every believer has living in them that convicts us, convinces us. Just like Peter, this confession of Peter then was driven by the Holy Spirit. Uh, then uh, it's same true with us. That, that at, at some point, that's why we don't baptize infants or babies or young children. As I don't. Because I believe that a person should be old enough to be convicted of sin and make a public commitment to follow Christ. Now that's going to change a six or seven year old kid when they make that decision. They're going to later on as they develop mental, you know, as they, de as they develop mentally and spiritually and the maturation process, they're going to have questions and doubts and it's going to you know they're gonna they're gonna fill out different logic questions doubts all that you know all that kind of stuff but yet uh, they had the faith of a of a young child but they need to remember that in, in my opinion so that's why I don't baptize five year old even a six year old I I really want to know I ask them I ask them usually. I ask them two questions when a kid comes down. I say, what does it mean to sin? And what does it mean to be saved? And if they can't articulate either one of those, then I just say, well, honey, you know God, or, you know, God loves you, but we just want you to come to a total awareness of what sin is and what it means to be saved. Because they're under the watch care. And we believe that they're under the, you know, the age of accountability. They're under the watch care of God. And uh, so... That that's that's some that's really the heart of what of what we believe about the church. Okay, so I can I can see how the Catholics get this in that they say you, know, you didn't come to this on your own, right? And you're the little rock, so I can see where he. I guess I can see where they can kind of build in the transference of power. Yeah. Of power. But no. how, how do they reconcile that with the veil splitting that he dies? You know, and all this. Right. Well, they, they really don't get into that, honestly. I mean, they, they, some of this came out of, and I, you know, we don't have time to chase all this, but some of this came out of church history politics. Power over uh, governmental control over, mainly the Romans. And uh, when the Roman Catholic Church when it became the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, th this, this belief didn't happen for several hundred years. Okay. Certain sort of purpose. Didn't and yeah. part of the purpose was they sort of backfilled okay. this. The early church councils that met, uh, the, the Council of Nicaea, the, the councils that got together to put the canon together, Bible that we have today, you know, that's a whole different, that's a whole different subject. How did the Bible come? You know, the early church had the had the Old Testament, mainly the, the early church. They had they didn't have a New Testament. I mean, they they wrote it, it was written post resurrection, post the founding of the church. The 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 earliest of the writings, uh, didn't happen until 20, 30 years after the death of Jesus and the death and resurrection. Because what was happening was that the eyewitnesses were dying off. The early church, and I know I'm chasing around here, but the early church uh, had a, a uh, it's called a cadre, but it, they, they had a, uh, they had a, a, a body of teaching of which all the New Testament is founded on, and it's called the Kerygma. And it was the what they were doing. It, it, you see it some in Acts chapter six, where the apostles were taking the teachings of Jesus 
that were oral at that time. They were all oral. They'd been passed them. And so the Holy Spirit then was prompting these apostles to begin to write down the teachings of Jesus. The sayings of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus. And then interpreting them in light of the Old Testament. So they began to see how what Jesus said fulfilled the Old Testament. So the kerygma then was this body of teaching that uh, Mark used to write his gospel and then he no doubt was the first one written and then uh, probably uh, Matthew and Luke and Acts were written as a tandem set uh, two volume set to tell the story of Jesus to Gentiles Matthew's gospel is written to tell the story of Jesus to Jews. Mark's gospel is written just to make sure everybody knew what you know, he was writing down. It's the shortest, but it was... And so it was oral until they started to write it down. And then it later then was put into books that had chapters to them. And then... Uh, Later, the, the early church leaders began to take all these writings and then they had to decide what was inspired and what was apocryphal. So the Catholics have the apocrypha. They have those books, that's what it's called the interlinear period, between the Old Testament and the, and the New Testament, the canonizing of the New Testament. And there are books in there that, you know, there's the Gospel of Thomas, there's other books have been written about Jesus that they did not believe were uh, true. Has Jesus doing all kinds of goofy stuff. And, and the people that wrote it weren't actually eyewitnesses. So there, there was a lot of there was a lot went in to getting this book. To getting the Bible. But basically what we have today has been canonized since the early 200s, 300s, 400s, it, it evolved, but it's pretty much, we've had this for you know, a long time. Uh, you know, fascinating to, to me as a Southern Baptist pastor, I grew up only having what was the King James. That was the only Bible that I ever knew existed. And it was hard for me to read. Uh, and honestly, I didn't know there was another more modern translation of the Bible until I went to seminary. And they handed me a Revised Standard Version to be the book that I was to use through seminary. And it was like, wow, okay, well, I can actually read this. So, but I've had people in church argue with me over the years that, uh, and this is very... Uh, I don't, I don't, it, it's very small-minded in some ways. It's ignorance, but you know that the King James is the only inspired version, and if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Well, you know, Jesus didn't speak English. Right? He spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, and and, and Greek. And uh, <laughs> uh, so a lot of times, just quit arguing. People will find look, just if, whatever Bible you got, you know, just read. <laughs> just use, just use, read it, you know. And not, let's not argue about the these and the therefores and the wherefores and whatever. Just if you'll read it, but the the modern translations are based on manuscripts of the original language. And most of the people who go to seminary, we had to deal with the Greek in the New Testament and the Hebrew in the Old Testament. Uh, but I'm grateful that the, the canon is with us. Uh, so that was that's a little bit about the the history of the Bible. There's a whole. It's really you know he, he handles it I think in the book pretty well. Uh, he he has a whole section on uh, the Bible, page sixty one, Revelation, inspiration and illumination. He he gets into some of that. Well, let, let me let me talk then about uh, 
I talked a little bit last week about how Baptist came to be. And we really came out of the Protestant Reformation. That, that was, you know, in the 1600s. When we, we really came out of that movement of, uh, the, the, you know, the Protestant Reformation comes out of protest. And the protest was the, the, the Catholic Church um, pretty much said that salvation came through the church. It was through the mass. It was through uh, the baptisms. Baptism, as you know, you were baptized into the into Christ. You were baptized into the church. It was through taking of the the Eucharist. It was, uh, and then and then it was works. So there were three elements. The you were baptized as Catholic. You were you, you took communion, came to mass, and then you did good works. So, Martin Luther then, who was a Roman Catholic at that time, took the Book of Romans and uh, translated it uh, into uh, Latin. Uh, and then uh, German. It was in Latin. He, he, he put it in German. And so when, when he translated it from Latin to German, he came to believe that salvation uh, was by grace uh, through faith. And so, I mean, that's a real simple... He, he, he nailed his... 65 theses to the Wittenberg door and you know, started the Protestant Reformation. But so I, and they, they split. The, the, he started the Lutherans, Martin Luther. But then out of that came, uh, came Church of England, came uh, Presbyterians, uh, Methodists, trace their roots back to that. But what Martin Luther, what this what the what the Lutherans continued to do was they continued to practice infant baptism. And they continued to take what, what you would call uh, state uh, baptism. In other words, to be a part of the state you had to be baptized as a Roman Catholic. So they, to be a German, to be a French person, to be whatever, uh, they continue to practice this infant baptism. Well, there was a group of people then that believed that baptism was only of believers. And it was done by immersion. So out of that group then, and this is a very simple very almost simplistic, almost, you know, they'd hate to, it'd be like you trying to explain to somebody about some disease, and it, you know, you just say, well, you get a cold. <laughs> you just get that. Well, uh, I mean, there's a lot more to it. But out of that came a group named Baptist, okay? And part of, we talked about the distinctives of Baptist last week is, is baptism and some of our, our belief about salvation is by grace we do believe that. And then we talk about the Lord's Supper, about it's a symbol, it's not, there's not anything magical in the elements. It doesn't, it isn't essential to salvation. Uh, it isn't, yeah. So we, so we broke off straight from the loop. Pretty much, I mean, that's in a simplistic way. In a simplistic. We, we came out of the Protestant Reformation. There was another group that was being they were being persecuted by the Lutherans because they were only practice, they would only practice believers' baptism. And they said that if you've been sprinkled as an infant or whatever, you had to be immersed. And so they literally killed them. There were people that were killed. And they mainly lived in Holland. 
and then uh, some of them went to England, and then some of them came to America. And a lot of the early Roger Williams was Baptist, fleeing. They fled England and Holland and other places in Europe to, to come to have religious freedom. So we came to America because we, you know, and that's part of the bedrock of who we are as Americans, that there is this, it's freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. So we're, we're able to worship today in freedom because of our belief that, and really it's because of our heritage, that we came out of the state church. We, that, you know, if you're, it's like the Romans. Constantine said, everybody's a Christian. So the end result of that is everybody's a Christian and probably nobody's a Christian. Because it, it isn't just a creed that if you're, if you're a Roman citizen, you're a Christian. Well, that that's, flies in the face of the confession that we talked about. You know, it's just, and the church, the, 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 the church of England was that way. It was, uh, you were baptized, it's still that way today. And, you know, you're, you're, you're part of the Church of England, that means you're part of the English government. And so there, there's some of that today. But Baptists, then, are, then, we're an independent bunch. <laughs> and have been since the, since, our, since the beginning of our roots. So that's part of what flavors us, is that... Um, we believe in the autonomy. Autonomy. Autonomy of the local church. Uh, autonomy. <laughs> the autonomy of the local church. So, in other words, uh, we don't have a hierarchy. We don't have a pope. Right? There's nobody that can tell this church what to do. We are a congregational church. And that's why we, this, the church council that we're doing is intended to empower the congregation to make decisions. I'm a pastor. Been the, I've been a pastor. I've been full-time 40 years. Uh, part time 42 uh, so the role of the pastor then is shaped by this the pastor is the shepherd or the, he's the shepherd okay he's also in some ways the teacher he's the teacher he is the preacher you might even say you could say prophet in some ways. Uh, but under, in all of this, all of this, we are to equip people uh, to do the work of ministry. Ephesians, it's Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. So that's one of the roles where to shepherd the sh sheep teach them the teachings of Jesus, proclaim the Word of God, and equip people to do the work of ministry. That's, that's the role. The pastor, and, and part of what I guess my concern about Baptists at this point in our history is that uh, we're, some Baptist churches have, we're becoming more Catholic than we are back. In other words, there's this hierarchy. And there's this belief, which I think is unbiblical, that the pastor is the deal. You got the pastor here, and then everything flows to him, to the staff, and then flows out then to the congregation, and all that. There's this, there's this hierarchy. Well, the, the only... What this is to be is the pastor is to lead out in, in these areas, shepherding, preaching, teaching, and equipping, but not decision-making. So more and more Baptist churches are going to elders. 
And the elders in the Bible, in the New Testament, the elders are synonymous with pastors. So if, uh, if let's say Matt, let's say, let's just say we decided that Matt's, that, 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 that Springfield Baptist Church is going to go to the elder system. And, uh, and so we, the church elects people, and Matt Nguyen would be one of the elders, or, 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 or you could be one of the elders. Then you would have to decide, okay, then has God called me to be a pastor? Because that's what you are. That's, there, there's no difference in the New Testament between elder and pastor. There's, it's synonymous. They're interchangeable terms. And uh, so what, what churches are doing today is they're going to a higher, hierarchical system where the elders run the church. More and more Baptists. And it comes out of the Reform Movement. Uh, and we have roots in the Reform Movement of Martin Luther. We, we have... Calvin, uh, John Calvin, you know, there's some of that, you know, there, there's some, uh, Southern Seminary is big into teaching Reformed theology, and there's these younger pastors that are buying into elder systems, and they're going in, and they're blowing churches up, and they're, I think, putting the church upside down. I, I think it should be that, and I think the church, a fun, New Testament functioning church needs to be congregational in its essence that the congregation needs to have a say-so in what's going on and not just be run from the top down. Because if you run from the top down, then it's... Uh, well, and you're... One is... I mean, there are elder systems, I guess, that work. I, I just... I, I'm not a fan of them, obviously. I, I think it's... I've always believed that the congregation, that you tell the truth and trust the people. Just like, just like we voted last week on the church council. Well, there are people against that. You know, I was, I was amused, I guess, last week at how many people showed up that were not in the Sunday school meeting the week before and had no idea. Somebody just told them, oh, there's a change. And so I saw people last week I never laid eyes on. I thought, who are these people? And I thought, I know, they'd come to vote now. <laughs> and that's, that's their privilege. That's right. It's their privilege. I mean, that's how we're run. Well, but the overwhelming 84% of the people said, we're good with it. Well, that's, in a Baptist church, that's, that's strong as pig iron. 84% strong as pig iron. I voted on something like that. But I think that's healthy myself. I think it's healthy to have input from the congregation. Otherwise, we, we're reverting back to a Catholic model and not a, and not a congregation model. So because of our belief uh, in, in the congregational model then, is we do not have a hierarchy. So every church is autonomous. So just in the few minutes we've got left, most of you know this, but just uh, Make sure that you under that you understand. So here's we're uh, <clears throat> we're Springfield Baptist Church, okay. So here here's our church. We're we're Springfield, and uh, Baptist Church founded in what 1843 or something 46 or whatever it was. This is 1846. I think that's right. Uh, local body of baptized believers and there's a we have documents we have constitution bylaws we have a confession of faith and all that kind of stuff so we are then part of the robertson county association okay but this is it, it is a dotted line what it means is they can't tell us what to do we voluntarily cooperate with Let's just say 60 other churches. I don't know if there's that many. 60 churches. And Springfield then gives uh, dollars to the Robertson County Association who ministers to churches, to people in the area, and then does mission projects together. So they go to Haiti. They go to Sp Spain. They're going to Spain next year, this year. They do ministry together. So we voluntarily cooperate in that. 
but the Robertson County Association can't tell us what to believe. Now, there is credentials. This Robertson County Baptist Association has credentials. Okay? Uh, I don't know the way you spell it. They have credentials. That in order to be part of the Robinson County Association, you have to be a Southern Baptist Church. There are certain things you've got to believe. So, if for, for whatever reason, Springfield decided to start ordaining uh, homosexuals, we would no longer be part of this association because they have credentials. Now, this church can do. I, my job at Lifeway, part of what I do, there are 42 Baptist conventions that I, my, part of my job is I relate to them. I, I manage the relationships Lifeway has with these 42 state conventions. Well, those conventions, well, let, let me get to that in a minute. So, I'm jumping in. So, then the Robertson, so we're, all, we're part of the Robertson County. They have credentials that, that we have to agree to. Okay. We're also we're also part of the Tennessee Baptist Convention. Okay. All right. And we also send dollars to them. Okay. The convention then we send what's called cooperative program money. We send cooperative program funds. Uh, to the Tennessee Baptist Convention. All right, they keep fifty percent of that to do work in Tennessee, and then fifty percent of that is sent on the SBC costs. SBC costs. That would be, and the SBC causes then. So it. So we're also part of that Southern Baptist Convention. Again, this is voluntary, but the Tennessee Baptist Convention also has credentials that we have to agree to. And again, the line between us and the Tennessee Baptist Convention is dotted. And it says they can't tell us what to do. We voluntarily cooperate. Nobody, Randy Davis, the, the president of the Tennessee Baptist Convention, cannot come to Springfield Baptist Church and say, you've got to do this. And usually when they come, they thank us because of our the money, the thousands of dollars we're giving. Okay? The Tennessee Baptist Convention then is part of the SBC. And the SBC, again, they have credentials. So there is a there is a convention, I won't name it, but there is a convention that did, last year they have a church in in the in, in their so in their convention that has two women lesbians as the pastors. And the, that convention would not disassociate that church from that convention. And I know the guy that's over it, but anyway, that the, the, the SBC has what's called an executive committee. And uh, that's in Nashville. And they manage all of the money that's sent from conventions. They manage that money, and but they also have credentials. They have credentials. Well, they this uh, this convention was uh, we disassociated with that convention. We told them if you don't if you don't disassociate yourself with that church, we're going to pull your credentials, and they did. Now you're talking about the state convention. State convention. Okay. State convention got disassociated. So they no longer are Southern, they're not part of the Southern Baptist Commission. But is there, I know that there's probably not, but is there ever a time where the county or the state or the SBC's credentials are in conflict with each other, or do they pretty much have to be complimentary? To they're, they're, they're pretty much complimentary. The, the, the big deal that started in the 80s that got changed in the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message was ordaining women. And the Baptist Faith and Message will allow ordination of women except for senior pastors. So if Megan decided she wanted to be ordained, that'd be fine. 
We just aren't ordaining her as a senior pastor. We can ordain her as a children's minister and still be a Southern Baptist. It was a, it was a war in the 80s and 90s right. over this. People believing that only men were to be ordained. And so that got changed. That was in a lot of the documents. There's in a lot of credentials. If you ordained a woman in any capacity, you were disassociated with that. That got changed uh, in the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message. It, it's, the wording is fairly clear. And that's pretty much the most, the stand of most Baptists is that a woman can do anything except be the senior pastor. Well, this is a well, be called typically like, be, have the title of minister and have an associate pastor. They can be associate pastor. Okay. Yeah. Now that has something to do with the culture of the county and the area, and you know, you, you in, my, in my belief is that you want to serve people, you don't want to just make people mad. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, so the executive committee. Then we have we have three big buckets that they fill. And one is the it's international. It's called the IMB International Mission Board. I'm going Thursday with the president of the International Mission Board, Paul Chitwood. He was from Kentucky. I know him real well. I'm going with them to Africa, and uh, but they they send money, the money that we give to the Tennessee Baptist Convention. They send it to the executive committee. The executive committee then sends it to the IMB and to NAM, the North American Mission Board. They send money to them, okay, and then we have seminaries. We have six seminaries. That we, that we support. That's where the money goes. When I went to Southern Seminary, both in master's and doctorate or doctor work, uh, most of my education was paid for by you. I paid very little to go to seminary, both master's and doctor. I mean, it probably the three years of of master's and four years of doctorate seven years, I probably paid $7,000. And it would have cost me $100,000. If I'd gone to Vanderbilt or Duke or Emory or... That's right. So do you name the six wars? Huh? Can you name the six? Oh, it's uh, New Orleans. Uh, Southeastern, which is in uh, Wake Forest. Uh, North Carolina. Uh, we had uh, Southern in uh, uh, Louisville. Okay. We have uh, Midwestern, which is in uh, uh, Kansas City. Uh, we have Golden, which is not, it's called Gateway, which is in Southern California. It used to be in San Francisco. Now it's somewhere in Southern California. I can't remember. Place and then there's Southwest in uh, Fort Worth. Those are the six. And we support those six seminaries big time. Billions of dollars. And, and maybe it's all from the way, but does it appear that graduates out of the different six are starting to see, do they get a completely. Yes. Education is the same, or are we start to see. Oh, it's been different for 30 years. Okay. New Orleans is much more. New Orleans would be much more uh, ministry. New Orleans Gateway would be much more ministry oriented. Southwestern is more ministry of education. Okay. Strong, and all those strong preachers. Southern is known as the Reform School, where they're teaching Reform theology. Southeastern would be a blend of that. Midwestern is more balanced. So it it, it really has to do with a lot of before you want to go. Now, I, I graduated from Southern the first time in 79, the second time, second time in 86. But I, when I was there, it was known as the liberal of all the seminaries. But I, I went in, <laughs> I wasn't anything. I wasn't a conservative. I wasn't anything. I was a recovering alcoholic. <laughs> and I came out a conservative, a biblicist. But I appreciated being exposed to a lot of different points of view that I was in have to defend. We studied German theologians that were off the chart. 
guy named Bultmann. Uh, but, but it made me figure out what I believe and why. So, all right, folks. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Are you going to mention the... Uh -huh.